All right, welcome back to Paleo. Happy Friday. Hope everyone is uh, doing good out there and keeping up with the class. We're almost there, so one more week. Let's stick with it. And today we're going to talk about trace fossils. Next week we're going to cover the rest of the textbook because we're going to get into plants and paleontology, some paleoclimatology, and then next Friday we're going to just kind of discuss uh, probably live, uh, if you are able to make it, how the class has gone and how the remote transition went. And uh, just like hear from you a little bit, so we'll probably I'll talk about that a little bit more next week. Uh, so some announcements. All right, so let's talk about what we talked about last time. So that was Dino Day. So Wednesday was Dino Day. Hopefully you enjoyed that lecture. I certainly liked talking about it. <coughs> uh, so one thing that the dinosaurs, the legacy of the dinosaurs in the modern day, is is birds. Uh, but where did birds evolve from? Which type of dinosaur did they evolve from? So take a look at that list and think back to the last lecture. And five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, so looking at that list there, there is a couple sort of obvious options here. So. Pterosaurs are flying, di oh wait, nope, they're not dinosaurs, they're uh, reptiles. So pterosaurs are reptiles, they're not related, to, well they are related to dinosaurs, but they're not dinosaurs. And so they're not the ancestors of birds, even though they flew. Uh, the next one that might be a little bit misleading is the ornithischian uh, bird-hipped dinosaurs. Well, uh, okay, well birds have bird hips, bird-hipped dinosaurs have bird hips, they must be related directly with each other. Uh, and they're not. <laughs> it turns out that the birds actually derive from the theropod line, which is part of the Saurischian order. So the uh, bird hip in birds and the bird hip in dinosaurs is an example of convergent evolution, sort of solving the same problem, accommodating a, a crop and an enlarged gut. So uh, interesting. But yeah, the correct answer here is the Saurischian lizard-hipped dinosaurs, which is uh, probably a little bit counterintuitive, so keep that in mind. And the last one, so dinosaurs were blank-blooded, so a lot of debate about the metabolism of dinosaurs and the behavior of dinosaurs. One thing that would kind of settle those is figuring out if they were warm-blooded or cold-blooded, so which, which is it? Uh, three, two, one, and the answer is probably anyways, uh, probably all of the above, although we don't really know. Uh, it's likely that the larger dinosaurs were probably cold-blooded or else they would have some heat problems. Their much larger volume compared to their surface area would make it difficult for them to get rid of heat, a similar problem that modern elephants have. But smaller dinosaurs would have kind of the opposite problem where they would have trouble retaining heat. Uh, and so they were probably feathered to help retain heat. And that maybe points to being warm blooded. And they also probably needed a lot of energy for all the running around and hunting they were doing. Uh, and then another option is that maybe some of them were sort of in between, like modern tuna and great whites, uh, mesothermic. And again, the, the answer is probably there are probably dinosaurs on kind of all ends of the spectrum and everything in between. Uh, but we may never actually know the answer to this, but it's an interesting question to ponder and it has a lot of implications for how they actually behaved and lived. So uh, we go from dinosaurs and now we're going into trace fossils. So what are trace fossils? Trace fossils, sometimes called ichnofossils, the Greek for trace, uh, they're sedimentary structures and they're formed by organisms. So in said strat class, we spend a lot of time talking about primary depositional sedimentary structures. These are a different form of sedimentary structures, not formed by depositional processes, but formed by biologic processes. So critters doing stuff. So whether that's tracks, trails, burrows, borings, coprolites, so leavings, uh, etc. Any evidence of behavior that's sort of fossilized uh, and that's not a body fossil. So the, again, the, the great part about trace fossils is that the hard part body fossils are great for finding morphology, 
Uh, as we talked about, though, in the functional morphology lesson, sometimes morphology and behavior are kind of less linked than we would like. And so to get insights into how these things actually lived and what they did on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, in a lot of cases, the trace fossils are actually a little bit uh, more informative than the actual hard part skeleton. Um, we're pretty familiar with trace fossils in our kind of everyday lives. Uh, most of us uh, spent, you know, some time out in the woods, and we probably see uh, animal tracks. So, you know, these aren't truly fossils yet, but they're on their way there. Uh, this is a very interesting example here of, here's a bunny, hop, 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 hop. And then something happens. The bunny is gone. Uh, it might kind of looks like he sprouted angel wings and fluttered up to heaven, but uh, more likely uh, he kind of got eaten by a hawk there. So... Uh, pretty cool how you can see like all the feather impressions and things. Uh, and so one of the coolest parts about trace fossils is that you can actually sort of perform, you know, forensic analyses on these things. Uh, you look at the tracks and you kind of look at the structure of the tracks and you can sort of start thinking, well, okay, uh, what made these tracks? And in modern woodland tracks, we can go find the modern animal and sort of match things up. Not quite so easy in the ancient world, but we can do that. We can look at, here's the hard parts fossilized of this animal. Here's this trackway that we don't know. Maybe we can match these up. And it's, it's pretty difficult. Uh, but just by looking at these tracks, we can see evidence of behaviors. Uh, it's sort of like a dynamic action shot of what's going on. And we actually use this uh, to solve crimes uh, in forensic analysis. So uh, footprint analysis or like shoe tread analyses or tire tread analyses, uh, like in My Cousin Vinny, uh, police use these things to solve crimes. Uh, you, they can match up uh, your shoes to the scene of the crime. Well, hopefully not your shoes, <laughs> but uh, the, the culprit's shoes. Uh, they can match the tire treads up. And you can also see like cross-cutting of tire treads to get like relative ages and things like that. These are all things that you can do with trace fossils as well. Uh, so again, pretty neat. So there's that, the behavior aspects. There's also the stratigraphic importance. So we talked, we spent a lot of time, probably too much time, <laughs> uh, a lot of time in said strat talking about how you can relate primary depositional sedimentary structures like ripples, mega ripples, dunes, planes, uh, planar beds, anti-dunes, and kind of the shoots and pools, how you can relate that kind of spectrum of sedimentary structures to the spectrum of depositional energies. Uh, you can do a very similar thing with trace fossils. Trace fossils, certain organisms tend to live in certain environments. Some organisms like living in a very high energy shifting sandy environment and some organisms need very calm muddy waters and so if you kind of know that and you can kind of link up the traces with these environments uh, they become sort of predictive. Uh, another thing that trace fossils can provide us that sedimentary structures can't is that Trace fossils provide us evidence of what the substrate was like uh, before it was lithified. So generally we have the rock, we, have, we see the grains, we see the size, we see the sorting, we see the texture, and we see the sedimentary structures, and we see the end products of diagenesis and lithification. But as these critters were, were walking and burrowing and whatever they were doing, they weren't doing that on the solid rock. They were doing that on the ancient paleo surface, the mud or the sand or the unconsolidated sediment or the semi-consolidated sediment. Uh, and so by looking at their burrows, it gives you some idea of the air or water content of the sediment before it was all squished and squeezed out to make the rock. Uh, it gives you some idea of what the compaction was before it was lithified. It gives you some idea of how coherent it was, how kind of stuck together it was, and some idea of the stability of the sediment. Uh, all things that are eventually sort of destroyed during the lithification process, we see the end product, we don't really see the beginning product. So uh, pretty interesting. So 
uh, we're able to do a lot of the similar things that we do with primary sedimentary structures with these uh, trace fossil structures. Uh, another thing is, you know, they, these letters here all correspond to different um, ichnophases, which we'll talk about in a second, but like scolithos, blossophongites, zoophycus, uh, they occur in different areas along the kind of depositional setting. And so if you are able to kind of fingerprint them and know their characteristics that they favor, you can sort of use them to map out depositional environments. So that's all well and good, but why would we want to use these things over body fossils? Uh, you know, we've been talking about body fossils for the entire class, basically. Uh, why would we want to use just trace fossils? It seems weird. It's just burrows. It's not like the whole animal. Um, well, one advantage that they have is that they are preserved in a different manner than body fossils. So trace fossils are often preserved in rock that doesn't really have a lot of body fossils. So remember, it's very hard to become a fossil. Generally, you need like anoxic conditions or quick burial, uh, those are all things that don't favor trace fossils. So kind of in areas where you don't have body fossils, you probably have trace fossils and kind of vice versa. If you have body fossils, it means there's a lot of active critters around, uh, or sorry, not a lot of active critters around scavenging and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, it's sort of like one or the other. And the same kind of thing goes with like primary depositional structures, uh, ripples, laminations, and things like that. If there's critters digging around in the soil, it destroys those. So basically, our usual suspects, primary sedimentary structures and body fossils, in a lot of cases, those are gone. And the only thing that we have are the trace fossils. And so they're the only source of information. And as we're kind of trying to read the rock record, we have to be able to use all of the information that's available to us. And if what we have is burrows, we need to know how to read those burrows. Uh, another advantage that they have is that they're less affected by diagenetic effects. So we spent a lot of time at the beginning of the semester talking about taphonomy, the things that can happen to hard part remains from the time that the animal dies all the way to the time that it's actually collected or observed. And there's a lot that can happen. Uh, there's a little bit less that can happen to trace fossils. Uh, a lot of the taphonomy stuff that affects uh, fossils doesn't affect trace fossils. In fact, in a lot of cases, diagenesis can actually amplify the trace fossils and make them a little more obvious. Uh, and then the other big advantage is that uh, body fossils can be transported. So if you think about like brachiopods, like a brachiopod dies, its shell sits on the seafloor, a big storm comes along and that brachiopod fossil might be mobilized into a completely different environment. Uh, it's not in situ anymore. It's not where it was living. Trace fossils can't be transported. If you find a trace fossil, that trace fossil was created at that location. It hasn't moved and you know that. Uh, and then another thing that we kind of talked about here is kind of the evolution of trace fossils through time. Uh, in the early EDAC and everything was just kind of on the seafloor. Uh, stuff started kind of uh, exploiting the very, very tippy top of the seafloor. And then as we moved into the Cambrian, started getting into the ground a little bit farther. And then we really started exploiting uh, the in fauna in the ground. And then kind of ever since the Cambrian, we've had this great diversity of things trying to exploit every resource, the, the nutrients, the organic material that's stuck in the sediment those are valuable uh, resources and organisms have been exploiting them uh, all the way since the Cambrian. Now which particular organisms are exploiting them has changed over time, but sort of the manner in which they extract using like vertical burrows or horizontal burrows, uh, those kind of strategies haven't really changed that much. So how do we preserve trace fossils? So uh, just like body fossils, body fossils can be like the casts or the molds, uh, so can trace fossils. So there's kind of two major kinds where we have like full relief. So a full relief example would be like something kind of drilling in through the sediment and it either leaves a hole behind it and that would later get filled in with subsequent sediment. 
or a lot of critters as they're kind of digging through the soil, uh, there's soil coming out uh, the other end and sort of filling in the hole as they go uh, with, you know, fecal pellets and, and matter. Uh, these tend to be preserved in 3D, uh, full 3D geom geometries, and they also tend to be internal to the bed. Uh, so this is an example of full relief where you can actually see, you know, 3D tubes where they may be even cross-cutting each other, very complex interlaced geometry. Uh, and then there's semi-relief where something was sort of uh, digging along the top of the sediment or maybe making piles along the top of the sediment. And then those are preserved as either troughs or depressions left on either top of the bedding plane or the sole of the bedding plane above. Uh, and so this is an example of kind of troughs left on the top of the bedding plane where an organism was kind of digging through. Uh, all the fill is gone, but the trough that the animal made as it was going is left behind. So these are kind of very common ways that we are able to identify trace fossils. Uh, it's kind of hard to identify 3D trace fossils because it's very rare that you're able to get a glimpse at the three dimensions. So kind of just like with like fractures and strike it dips where you need like a 3D view, you often kind of want to go look at like the corner of an outcrop where you can see like the top view and like a side view wrap around to try to reconstruct the 3D geometry. Whereas the kind of semi-relief uh, is usually just good enough to look at the bedding plane. Uh, although you might see that down deeper into the bed, there might be a series, a stack of these uh, through time. So how do we classify ichnofossils or trace fossils? Well, originally they were just kind of given Linnaean names because they thought they were plants. Uh, they were so, a lot of them were originally thought that, okay, these are plants, let's give them taxonomic plant names. And that idea sort of stuck that we would name them like Linnaean taxonomy. So like, you know, genre names and species names. Uh, so we've kind of carried that on. And so each distinct trace fossil has a unique name. So like Scolithos. Scolithos is the name of a particular ichnofossil of kind of vertical, uh, almost sometimes called pipe rock because it looks like vertical pipes, vertical cylinder pipes uh, in, preserved in the rock. Uh, that's a distinct trace fossil that we see kind of over and over again in the rock record. Uh, one thing that's a little bit confusing is that Scolithos wasn't made by an animal called Scolithos. It's a trace fossil. It is a vertical burrow. That's what Scolithos means. There are probably multiple organisms over time that have made Scolithos burrows. Uh, so many very similar organisms behave similarly where they're making vertical burrows in a very rapid, sandy, shifting substrate. It, it doesn't have to be one organism. That organism can change through time. And it can even be kind of multiple organisms at the same time doing the same thing, living in the same style, and producing similar traces. Uh, another thing that's a little bit interesting is that one individual organism might be capable of leaving multiple traces. So like a trilobite, if a trilobite is just kind of resting on the seafloor, it makes kind of this depression, this like uh, uh, drop down in the mud. And uh, that's called rhizophycus. If they're kind of, you know, burrowing or furrowing down into the mud a little bit to kind of try to feed on particles in the mud, where they're actually kind of digging like a little trough, it's called cruziana. And when they kind of come up out of their feeding furrow, and they're just kind of trying to get somewhere, and they're kind of walking along on their little trilobite legs, uh, they make a different trace uh, called diplocnides. So one organism, a trilobite, actually several organisms, all different trilobites, making three different ichnofaces, or ichno genre, I should say. Uh, so it's kind of complex. So. Uh, just remember that when somebody says scolithos or zoophycus, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that that was one animal that was doing that. Uh, it could be multiple animals. And remember also that one animal is capable of making multiple different kinds of traces. So like think about us, 
uh, if it just snowed and you're walking around in your boots, you can make boot prints. If you take your boots off, burr, <laughs> you can make footprints. If you lay down in the snow, you can make snow angel prints. And if you press your hands into the snow, you can make hand prints. So there's a lot of different trace fossils that humans would be capable of making, uh, depending on our behavior. Or you might like jump, it would make a different track than if you're walking, and it would make a different track than if you're running. And each one of those would get assigned a different uh, igno genre. Uh, so we can kind of lump these things together into like broad categories. Uh, and the first one would be cubicnia, which are the resting traces. It, it, they result from the organism kind of took a break. It chilled out for a little bit. It kind of sat in one place. And it made a shallow depression uh, on the bedding surface. So this is either a depression in the upper bedding plane, or in a lot of cases, it'll be like a, a, a con, 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 convex relief on the sole of the bed above it. Um, so like, uh, for example, this is a starfish depression and you see that the, this is the actual starfish. He was resting there, uh, made a depression in the sand and then started moving out. And you kind of see some of the trace fossils left behind from the motion, but it left behind the starfish print. And this is a fossilized example of that. This isn't the body fossil. There's nothing remaining of the starfish here. It probably didn't even actually die at that location. It moved away. It went somewhere else. But uh, this particular one is called Asteriocytes. And it's made by starfish resting through time. Not any particular starfish, but a, a starfish resting fossil. Uh, Rhizophycus is a trilobite resting fossil. And again, it's not any single trilobite. It's not a trilobite called Rhizophycus. It's a resting fossil of any trilobite. And uh, what you often see is that you might see kind of detailed anatomical imprints on here. So one thing that we know about trilobites is they've got that really hard uh, kind of calcium and chitin, almost like a fiberglass skeleton. But their legs are very rarely preserved because they were soft. And so we read that one paper about like trilobite eggs that we saw some glimpses at trilobite legs and trilobite gill branches. One good way that we can look at these is by impressions in the sand or, or the mud. Uh, this is not a body fossil. This is mud, and actually this is the bottom of the overlying bed that was pressed down into the depression. Uh, but we can actually see the traces of the legs uh, from when this trilobite was kind of just sitting there in the mud, kind of taking a, taking a little trilobite snooze. Uh, so cubicnia are resting traces. Uh, domicnia, like domicile, are burrow traces that are basically where the animal is living. Uh, it might also be using it for feeding, but it's, it's where the animal's living. It's occupied long term. Uh, the animal is actually living there. Uh, it's not like the resting trace where they kind of stay there for a while and then they leave. Uh, our common experience with this is something like, you know, groundhog burrows, woodchuck burrows. Uh, they live in them. Uh, if you go down south, uh, if you walk around an area that's kind of frequently flooded uh, after it rains, uh, you might kind of see these chimneys kind of sticking up out of the ground. And these are, you know, crawdads, crayfish digging in the ground and kind of spitting mud out behind them. And you actually see like little imprints from walking around on there. Uh, another example that we're pretty familiar with is anthills. So one cool thing that people have started doing, you know, they, they melt aluminum and pour it into the anthill. Uh, you know, kind of mean, I guess, but if you've ever stepped on a fire ant hill, you probably have no sympathy for them at least, but other ants are cool. Uh, they pour down molten aluminum in here and it goes through all the little cavities, then they dig it up and remove the dirt and you have this really cool cast. Uh, you can actually find them on like eBay and Etsy and things like that, uh, ant hill art. So they're pretty neat. Uh, it just shows you the complexity that burrows can reach. Uh, and then this is kind of a more simple one. Uh, one that you see quite often in the fossil record, this is Diplocriterion, uh, pretty diagnostic. Uh, on the surface of the bedding plane, it kind of looks like little barbells because there is one hole here 
another hole here uh, in the bedding plane, which is sometimes maybe a little hard to get a look at. There's sort of this U-shaped burrow, and then there's kind of this like cross member that kind of connects them. And what we see is that these are forming in pretty high energy environments. And what it allows the organism to do is it allows, if sediment's accumulating, it allows the organism to kind of like go up in its burrow. And if sediment's being quickly removed away, it allows the animal to drop down in its burrow. And so it sort of yo-yos up and down as sediment is being kind of piled on top of them or as sediment's being stripped away. Uh, if you were on the Wellesley Island field trip, uh, there was, I think, one outcrop of the Potsdam sandstone where you could actually see these diplocriterion burrows in there. Uh, so uh, again, a, a very kind of rare glimpse at the behavior of an organism. And so if you see these diplocriterion burrows, uh, you know something about the environment, something about the substrate. It was a very quickly dynamic, shifting, changing, probably sandier environment. That's very valuable information for reconstructing your paleo environments. Uh, the next one is uh, repicnia. Uh, these are traces that are created during routine movement. So uh, not actively feeding, but just locomotion. They're, they're going somewhere. Uh, and these can be recognized because they're uh, kind of elongate trails. Uh, they're generally somewhat linear, although some of them are a little bit more uh, curvilinear than others. This guy didn't really know where he was going. Um, but they're elongate trails on the top of bedding planes. Uh, they, they're like delicate marks of the trace maker's legs. Uh, and again, one thing that's pretty cool about this is trilobite legs are rarely preserved, but we actually see them in these Cruziana trace fossils. Uh, we see evidence of how trilobites moved around. Uh, in this case, it's actually a Cruziana uh, movement, and then there's actually the resting igno fossil here. That's not a trilobite body, but it's a trilobite resting uh, impression. Uh, this is sort of a rare instance where you have the locomotion track and then the body fossil at the end. Uh, you can even actually see where some of its, its tail has sort of made some marks in the sediment as well. Uh, if you look over here, you can see a couple other tail marks. Um, that's kind of rare. Uh, remember, in a lot of cases, all we know are the tracks and the traces and we assign them a name, and we don't know necessarily which organism actually made them. Uh, in this instance, we do, because it's, it's right there. It's pretty clear what made this track, uh, but it's not quite as straightforward in most cases. And so we name the track, and we may or may not know which organism created it. And again, it might be multiple organisms that make the same track. Uh, pretty much every trilobite makes some form of this Cruziana track. Uh, they might be very subtly different in morphology and shape and size, but they're pretty uh, reminiscent of each other. And again, you can kind of see like uh, cross-cutting relationships, size relationships. It gives you some idea of behavior, some a, a little snapshot into time that we don't often get just looking at the hard parts. Uh, one way that this is, well, pro probably the most dramatic example of this are uh, dinosaur trackways. So movement traces, uh, we, vertebrates make movement traces as well. And by analyzing these, it can provide us a lot of information on how fast they could move, how they moved, what their gait was, uh, how heavy they were by how compressed the sediment was. Uh, there are some examples of sauropod footprints actually like crushing, like uh, freshwater bivalve beds. Uh, it also gives us some information on their behavior and even maybe some migration strategies. So uh, this is the longest continuous sauropod trackway in the world. It's in France. Uh, and this is in the Morrison Formation, uh, Dinosaur Hill, uh, with some theropod tracks, the kind of classic three-toe. Uh, but by looking at kind of, you know, the midline versus how far out the steps are, how long each of the strides is, and kind of the pattern of these steps, you're able to say something about the animal. Uh, you can also differentiate between front feet and back feet and really make some 
very complex uh, morphological analyses. And you can kind of tell, was this animal walking? Was it running? Was it, uh, you know, how was this thing moving around? Uh, another cool thing, this is a pretty neat example here, where there is a bunch of tracks of sauropods. And remember from the last lecture, uh, the sauropods are all herbivorous, or herbivorous. And theropods, the three-toed guys, are here kind of on the periphery of these tracks. Uh, and again, the relative timing of this is, is tough to work out. Uh, although you can see instances where the theropod track is literally in the sauropod track, and so you know that the theropod came after. But this may be an example of theropods actually kind of hunting or stalking their prey. Uh, they're following along with the herd. Uh, another thing that we see is that they're all sort of oriented in the same direction. So this is telling us that th this is a group of animals. So it tells us something about like herding behavior. And they're all going the same way and tells us something about maybe migration behavior. Uh, there's one pretty cool study uh, that actually has pathways sort of going along an old fault zone. So you can actually see evidence of old ancient tectonics uh, affecting biology and affecting the, the where organisms are moving. Uh, if you're a hunter at all, you know that animals tend to kind of follow topographic lines. And that's true today and it was true before. Uh, another thing that you can see from here is that in general, the bigger footprints are on the outside and there's some littler footprints on the inside. And this is something that modern animals do where they sort of keep the more vulnerable younger animals in the middle of the herd and the larger animals on the outside to kind of try to protect the herd. And uh, this is evidence of, well, possible evidence of that happening in dinosaurs. So it sort of gives us this idea that uh, dinosaurs were cooperating and had like a herd mentality in some cases. Uh, things that just looking at the bones, you can't know. So very valuable insights into how these things live. What was the everyday life like back in the Cretaceous? What was it like to be a seropod dinosaur moving around in a herd, being stalked by a large theropod predator? How were they responding? How were they protecting themselves? Uh, so dinosaurs are cool. Uh, you know what else is cool? Humans. So trackways that are preserved in the rock uh, preserve our transition to bipedalism. So what we see here, a uh, chimpanzee footprint versus a gorilla footprint versus our footprint with the more developed arch and kind of a less prominent big toe, uh, much less graspy, less hand-like and more foot-like more adapted to walking around on two feet, bipedal versus quadrupedal. Uh, so we, we came down from the trees and we started walking more and more upright and our footprints changed through time as a result of this. And so what you can see, this is an actual hominid footprint track uh, from Tanzania, uh, Laetoli. And this is probably the earliest uh, hominid footprint track, uh, probably Australopithecus. So if you think back to Lucy, the Austral Australopithecine, uh, these are trackways probably associated with uh, Lucy-like animal uh, organism, uh, hominid. Uh, one thing that's pretty neat about this is that you see a larger set of footprints and it looks like there's a smaller set of footprints. It might even be like a, a child along with the way. Uh, probably the most famous example of hominid footprints, though, is uh, the Bigfoot myth and legend. And this is potentially the guy that got it started by, uh, for some reason, walking around with uh, Bigfoot sandals on and leaving these massive impressions. And, uh, you know, it still persists to this day. Maybe it's out there. I don't know. Talk to Dave about it. He's got some interesting ideas. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, just again, a very fascinating look at the behavior of an organism, a lot of insight provided just based on footprints. And so just looking at burrows, just looking at traces, we're able to do a similar thing with invertebrates and other animals. Uh, another type of these traces are uh, pas pasychnia or like uh, grazing traces. 
uh, it represents like systematic feeding behavior. Uh, they're not just simply moving around. They're not trying to get to another place. Uh, they're trying to exploit the substrate for resources. So you might see like a kind of systematic wandering pattern or even like a grid-like pattern to try to get all available resources. And so uh, as opposed to like Cruziana, or uh, sorry, as opposed to like the, the walking traces, uh, this is an Isotila here, one of the largest genre of trilobites, actually kind of furrowing in and digging. Uh, remember, hey, cool, it's got like this flat cephalon, kind of shovel shaped. Uh, this is it kind of being caught in action, doing what we thought that it was supposed to do based on its morphology. Uh, it looks like the head was adapted for digging in the sub sediment. Well, hey, looky here. There we go. That's what it's doing. Uh, another different kind are uh, agrichnia, when, like, agri like farming. Uh, this is very similar to the grazing traces, except it's kind of like a little bit more long lived. Uh, it's basically a, a network of sustained, and they kind of live in there too. So it's kind of like a hybrid with the domicnia, where they're sort of living in there and sort of farming in there. Uh, and then there's another kind called uh, phodicnia, you know, food, uh, where the deposit feeders are actually kind of living in the bed, move burrowing around in the bed, and as they kind of chew their way forward through the deposits, uh, stuff's coming out the back. And so you can get these kind of like very complex uh, 3D, this is a Thessaloides. Uh, there's a really good example of this in the back of the lab. Um, but you get this kind of complex 3D network. You can actually see like there's kind of this one's kind of overlaying this one. Uh, same thing you can see here. This is overlaying this one. Uh, it's a kind of very complex 3D pattern. Another thing that you'll notice is that the infill of the burrow is different than the substrate. So all that sediment has been processed uh, through the organism or it's just stuff that later infilled. And so it's different than the surrounding matrix. And so it usually it very often has a kind of differential erosion and it can kind of make it stick out in 3D even more as it weathers. Uh, so again, a lot of different interesting behavior patterns that are preserved in the rocks here just by looking at burrows. But the real power of these things is kind of grouping them together and clustering them into assemblages. So there's a concept of, of ichnophases which is assemblages of trace fossils that are sort of commonly found together. And the reason they're commonly found together is they're made by organisms that kind of like the same environment. And so these are like artificial groupings. They're not uh, just like when we're classifying rocks, there's not really like a hard boundary. There's little blurry divisions in between, but again, uh, we're trying to classify things in useful ways. So to some degree, these are artificial but they're helpful. Uh, and so we lump together a lot of different ichno genre that are commonly found together and we call it an ichno facies. So like, for example, if we look at the Glossophongites, ichno facies, these are four typical ichno genre that are found in it. And uh, there's a key over here for the different letters. So like, for example, seven is, uh, <laughs> Should have probably picked a different one. <laughs> Gastro echinolites, I don't know, whatever. Um, but yeah, so uh, we lumped these things together. You'll notice that these burrows are mostly sort of irregular, sort of vertical ish, which means that it wasn't a hard substrate because this is more digging than drilling, but it's sort of more vertical. And then as you go out, uh, they're kind of more horizontal and uh, again the, the grouped together in similar shapes, similar behaviors, similar cre creatures liking a similar environment. Uh, and so like uh, we kind of group them based on the substrate. So these ones vary based on what kind of substrate there is and these vary more on what the environmental energy is. And so it kind of forms a matrix. Uh, and it doesn't just work in the marine environment like this. It can be extended to the terrestrial environment as well. And so there's all these different terrestrial ichnophases as well. 
So it's very powerful, very interesting. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of take a look at this diagram uh, in a little bit more detail. So the ichnophases provide information on the substrate, the sand or the mud or the silt. What is the seabed made out of? How stuck together is it? How competent is it? How coherent is it? How compacted is it? How much pore space is there in it as the animals are living, not after it's lithified? And so these three different ichnophases provide a lot of information on that. So uh, this one's a little bit less common in the rough fossil record, especially around here. Uh, Teratolites, uh, they're shipworms. So they're these little bivalve clams with these long kind of wormy bodies uh, that actually eat like docks and piers and wooden ships. Uh, they also eat into driftwood. And so if you have like a woody substrate like peat or something, driftwood, these, these things will be pretty prevalent. Uh, more commonly, uh, we have like triponites, which form on rocky coastlines or carbonate hard grounds. And so the significance of a carbonate hard ground is that it's, it's lithified. And so the seafloor is actually rock, which means that it's probably been exposed for a pretty long time. And because it's been exposed for a pretty long time, it's kind of cemented together and animals can't just freely like burrow into it. So they have to actually like actively drill into it. And so you get these kind of smaller pinhole and they're very kind of smooth sided and regular. These are actual borings, they're triponides. If you have a semi-consolidated sediment where it's more of a firm ground where you can kind of bore, burrow through it, you're actually digging, uh, the burrows become a little bit more irregular, a little bit more branching and you see that difference with the substrates. So this provides a lot of information on, if you see triponides, it means that it, it's a hard ground. When these animals were living on the surface, the surface was already pretty well lithified, which means that it was probably a, a disconformity a long time without any deposition. And glossophongites, uh, it's a kind of semi-consolidated substrate the way that something gets semi consolidated is by being buried a little bit and then things are living on top of it. So that means that it was exposed. So again, evidence of a disconformity. So some time is missing here. It's an erosional surface. So if you're able to read these different burrow types, you're able to kind of recognize these potentially important stratigraphic surfaces. Uh, so the substrate information is important. Uh, depositional energy can also be gleaned from here. So uh, as a rule of thumb, and it's not always true, but in general, as you go nearer to the shore, it's higher energy, tends to be coarser grained. So like you think of a beach, you think of sand, shifting sand with high wave energy. The burrows there tend to be more vertical. As you go offshore, the energy dissipates as the water gets deeper and you get below wave base and even below storm wave base and you get a lot lower energy environment and the burrows tend to become a little bit more horizontal. So like uh, scolithos, these are scolithos tubes, again, sometimes called like pipe rock. Scolithos ichnophases forms in a very dynamic, shifting, high energy nearshore environment. The sand is always being moved around. The organisms have to be able to quickly move up or quickly move down. And the way that you do that is with a relatively vertical burrow. Uh, Cruziana is a little bit lower energy, and so they're not being buried as quickly. The sea, sea floor is a little bit more stable, and they're able to develop a little bit more horizontal. Uh, not fully horizontal, but a little bit more. Uh, again, you can look at an outcrop. You'll see like on the bedding plane burrows versus into the bedding plane. Uh, and then if you go way offshore into the very, very low energy environments, uh, like the calm, muddy, abyssal plain, you'll see these kind of elaborate branching networks that uh, probably takes a lot of time to build something this complex. Uh, it means that these things are not being disturbed for a long time. Nothing's really shuffling this around and the critters are able to kind of work in, in peace and nothing's being reordered. Um, 
And then uh, Zuphicus is a little bit different than all these because sometimes Zuphicus is found in, in both of these facies. So Zuphicus seems to be less associated with a given wave energy and more associated with um, it's found in lower oxygen or almost anoxic conditions, very hostile environments. Uh, whatever it is that makes the Zuphicus trace, so some kind of organism kind of coming up and sweeping across, making this kind of like fan shape on the seafloor, whatever it is that makes that trace is pretty hardy and it doesn't really react as strongly to the hostile low oxygen environments and so it can be found in those as everything else is gone. So Zuphicus tells you that, okay, well, this is a more hostile environment here. I'm probably not gonna find a lot of other trace fossils. Um, and then the last thing that this is useful for is a uh, bioturbation index. So if you're out in the field and you're working in soft rocks and you're making a strat column, uh, one thing that's pretty important to note, obviously you note grain size, you note sorting, you note any primary sedimentary structures that you see. Uh, one common reason why you wouldn't see primary sedimentary structures is that they've been destroyed by bioturbation. So bioturbation index is usually noted on stratigraphic columns as well. And it's sort of a zero through five or sometimes six, uh, where like zero bioturbation is absent. All the primary structures are still there. Uh, micro laminations are still there. Everything's fine. Nothing's been disturbed at all. Uh, this is pretty common in anoxia where there's no critters and nothing's disturbing the sediment after it's deposited. Uh, in a little bit more harsh environments, you might get a little bit of burrowing here and there, but the bedding is still pretty distinct and it's only disrupted in a few different places. And two is just a little bit more, three is a little bit more, four is a little bit more. Now it's starting to get hard to kind of pick out original bedding because it's so disrupted. Five is that it's almost completely disrupted, although there's still traces, you can just kind of barely make it out. And then six is 100%, it's all been churned up, all of the primary depositional structure is gone, and all you have left are trace fossils. Uh, and how this is manifested sort of varies on environment. So like, uh, this is like a shelf environment, where you start with kind of thicker, planar lamini, churn it up a little bit, churn it up a little bit more, churn it up a little bit more, churn it up a little bit more, this is what you end up with. This is like a very high energy, scolithos, sandy environment, uh, high energy, cross bedding, strong wave action, a uh, few vertical burrows, a few more vertical burrows, a few more vertical burrows, dominated by vertical burrows. And so this is increasing bioturbation. Uh, this is uh, a similar example where we've got a relatively high energy environment, but it's a, maybe a little bit lower. And so we get sort of these more branching. Uh, and again, increased bioturbation, the primary structure is being eliminated more and more and more and more. And then this would be like what happens in the abyssal plane. Uh, you start with like very finely laminated things, horizontal laminae maybe little tiny touches of burrowing, more burrowing, more burrowing, more burrowing, more burrowing. So bioturbation is pretty important because it's able to, you're able to quantify how things have disrupted and it's sort, of, it's sort of an indicator of how healthy the environment is. If there is not a lot of bioturbation, it either means that the environment was sort of hostile or deposition was very quick. Uh, if there's a lot of burrowing, it either means that uh, it was a really great environment or that there was just a lot of time for the organism to kind of chew on the sediment and work into it. So uh, it can provide insight into environmental energy and it can also provide insight into exposure times and depositional rates. So pretty powerful. And uh, last slide, the disclaimer. So that's all I got for today. I hope you all enjoyed this. Uh, maybe not quite as glorious and glamorous as dinosaurs, but probably more important uh, more useful anyways, especially around here, uh, you're going to see a lot more burrows <laughs> than you are dinosaur footprints, uh, dinosaur bones. So uh, that's all I got for today. Happy Friday. Enjoy your weekend and goodbye. <laughs>